thank you very much for the honor. I must acknowledge I did not bargain for the traffic I met tonight. <laughs> and that just makes me identify with those that may be having struggles coming here sometimes. It is annoying. <laughs> sometimes I believe that the Spirit of God allows us to go through things so that we understand what people go through and understand when people say there was traffic. I was, I was, I, I was livid. <laughs> Mama is somewhere in under Uber car. She's navigating herself up here. But it's going to be beautiful. Now, can we just go straight into God's word right away? So I was tuning in all along yeah, um, online and I was trying to catch up on what's going on. And I want to thank the media team for making that possible so that we can catch up with what's going on. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause now. I'm not sure so that when we have to criticize them, they will know we are not out of prejudice. You know? Well done, guys. Okay, well done. I mean, it can just keep getting better. Um, but I think that there's an echo on the sound online. I don't know what's making that happen, but otherwise, I think it's, it's okay. All right. Praise God. Can you smile tonight? Amen. I believe that the smiles are very useful for this season. But Charles, thank you for holding forth. And I want to welcome everyone. Please, can you greet your neighbor before we go into the word? Tell the person, good evening. How are you today? You notice I don't forget to do that. It's, it's something that I believe is important to do. Check up on ourselves to be sure that we're fine. All right, I'm ready for the word. Are you ready? All right, before I bring the word, I, I planned that I was going to do something and I want to try to do it before we go on. Um, it's Christmas season and once we talk about Christmas, we're talking about the gradual closure of the year. If I want to say Christmas, it's like saying Happy New Year, you know, because it's just a week away. Before I go ahead, I want to give room for something I think is special tonight. Does anybody have a question that bothers you, that has been on your mind, relationship related, finance related, academics related? Does anybody have any question that may interest or bother you that you would like to ask? I plan deliberately. I want to say something, but I just plan deliberately to give room for that um, because of the kind of meeting we have tonight. Any questions? Anybody? Don't be embarrassed. You can write it on a sheet of paper. Any question that bothers your mind? You know all things, people. I know. You guys know all things. Well, if you don't have a question for me, I have a question for you. Yeah? And I hope you will answer my own question. Does anybody have any question? It's deliberate. I, I, I want to share something I agree. But I also plan that before I go into the sharing, does anybody have any question? Someone wants to ask, Pastor, how do I make money? Or what question do you have in your heart? What question? You should have a question. If you're not asking questions, then you're not getting answers. And life, if you ask a 10 million naira question, then you get a 10 million naira answer. It's the kind of question you ask that will determine the kind of answers you get. All right, any question, please. If you ask a relationship question, you get a relationship answer. Anybody with questions, please? Questions? Someone should have a question. Minister, no question. All your questions are answered in the Lord. Eh? Empty, no question. Leader, no question. No question. No question, chief. Statuera, no question. Mrs. Oshikosi, you stepped out. No question, sir. No question. Ask question. I, I don't know. I believe. Okay, so let me not force you. Stop this. No question. You have one. They are not sure if you can ask for me. Eh? Mr. Jared Sola, any question? Online, any question? Amen? Brother Arnold, no question. All right, so I can go and preach my word. Now let me just tell you something. Don't say your questions were not answered. I gave you a blank check to ask any question. Oh, he has a question. He said it's not 
his hands went up. I ask again, any question on anything, any matter that troubles you, I believe it's not an afterthought. I believe you were just waiting for the guy to ask. All right, so shoot. Quickly. Glory. Okay. And sin. Very good. And he was talking, okay. A known pastor in the US was talking about his growth, his, his growth in Christian faith, and how God was still using him while he was masturbating. He was still masturbating up to he got married until about six years into marriage. So I was, I was dazed because I'm of the opinion, I, I am aware that, um, that all those sin blocks glory and it doesn't let it shine, it doesn't let it radiate as much as God wants it to. So my thought was, I was a little confused in my thoughts and I was wondering how God could still keep using such a person in um, growth in his, and his Christian faith was increasing it was getting stronger to the point that we could even start a church. The church was growing. And then up to like five, seven years afterwards was when he now had to stop. He was delivered from the masturbation and he came out publicly to speak about it. So I'm a little confused that God can still use a person. So my question is not an alpha thought actually. I was just trying to process how to present the question. So sir. So ask the question. So, how does he walk in that line that somebody is still doing such a thing and God is still using them? Is, it not, is, it's not, is God not supposed to make them work on that process thoroughly before he can still use them to grow his church and all that? I don't know if my question, if I'm, if I'm asking the question rightly, but I believe that. I, I think I get your question. I think, I, I think your, your question is is it possible for God to be using someone who is still doing something wrong and in fact he's increasing at it and he's, the work of God is working in his hands. Right. Thank you very much for that question. Alright, let me try to answer the question. But before I do, do you have any question? So, I have one question down. Quickly. Yeah, quickly, sir. Gentlemen, help me get the microphone to him. Brother Arnold, quickly, please. What's the question? Shoot and shoot hard. Question. Please, I'll take two more. If you have, just help us hit it on the ground. Run it quickly, sir. My Straight. question is, did death exist before the creation of the world? Did death exist before the creation of the world? Please, oh, why are you asking that question and where is it coming from? Sir, because I was reading my Bible Monday and I found out in Genesis... In Genesis 3, verse 22, that God's original plan was there were two trees in the garden. The tree of knowledge and of good and evil and the tree of life. Okay. So I found out in Revelation, Revelation 21, that the tree of life was meant for the saints after the rapture. So in Genesis 22, God, after casting man out, he said, the reason he casted man out, According to what I read, it was so that man will not eat of the tree of life and live forever. So, that clarity. I feel, I feel proud somewhere in my heart. I'm not sure. That's the kind of question I used to ask when I was young. You want to ask what you want others to do to you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Very powerful question. What do you think? Some of you are almost asking that. Ah, is that so inside my Bible? <laughs> All right. Two more questions and I will respond. Two more. Any more? If there's none, fine. Any more? Any more? Question. You again. No. Give us a chance. Let's finish the first one you've asked. Yeah. Any more, please? 
anymore. Okay, give me the mic since there's no more. Let's take one more. Start. You, do you want to raise your, your hand? It's small, small. Used to start like this. <laughs> quickly, 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 please. Hey, I shoot hard. I shoot fast. Quick. Sir, please. What was the light that was? Sir, in Genesis, God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. But later on, on the fifth day, He made the firmament, the sun, moon, and stars. So, sir, where well, the light? Very legitimate questions, Abby. Praise God. All right. Thank you, sir, for making me proud. God, too, will be proud of you. Yes, please. Yeah? Ma, you want to ask questions? Shoot. You're not, hurry up now. You know time is going. Hurry up so that we know where that. You want to ask? Okay, pray. Can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, as I make attempts to speak to these questions, I ask that they will not only answer questions in our hearts, but they will bath pathways into new levels in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let me make a quick attempt to answer the first question, which speaks about how that, is it possible for God to be using a man in the light of glory? And when I said, when we spoke about sexual sin, or sin taking glory, although I was specific about sexual sin, but every form of sin will take glory from you. Why do I say so? The Bible says all have sinned and came short of the glory of God. Please, you know I'm not the one that said so. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What it was saying was that it was the glory of God man had, but it was sin that robbed man of that glory are we making some sense is that romans 3 23 yes for all have sinned and have fallen short what we came short was not our height was not our strength was not our it was the glory of god that we came short of and that was why i was saying that sin will rob any man any day of the glory nature what glory means is that your full capacity what God has ordained for you. A life without sin can accommodate much more than a life that has sin. That does not mean that God cannot still use the sinner. So to speak, there are many scriptures that imply that God can use even an imperfect vessel. If a kettle is black, it does not mean you cannot boil water. You are not drinking the kettle, you are using the kettle. And it's important to understand that God can use a vessel without necessarily the vessel being yielded to God. So it's possible. All have sinned. If all have sinned, God still used people that were born in sin, like Moses. God still used Abraham. Abraham married two wives, slept with another woman, you know, somewhere along the journey. You know what I'm saying? So God doesn't mind using the imperfections. Let me say this, however, that in my honest opinion, the place of sin against the believer's life, in my honest opinion, sometimes can be exaggerated. Hear what I'm saying? So some people say, ah, he has committed sin. His destiny is finished. That is not true. Please, do you understand what I'm trying to say here? That is biblically so not true. It is true that what he has done is wrong. But sin does not have dominion over the Christian. And I'm not saying that to accommodate sin. Please, do you understand what I'm saying? But we should not say something that is not true just because we want to keep your moral rectitude upright. It's not necessary. Let's tell the truth. Sin cannot dismiss a man. And I'm saying it from the authority of scriptures as a servant of God on the altar of God based on the authority as given to me. Sin cannot take you from God. This is what I'm saying. Now, but does that mean you should continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. You should notice the language. He said, God forbid. Why will he say such a question? It's because he's telling you that sin cannot do much on you anymore. But should we now continue because we know that sin cannot? He said, now say, God forbid. Do you, do you notice that energy there? So, but many times some Christians say, ah, what buy it there? Why? Because he fornicated. Fornication cannot finish your destiny, sir. It's the degree you give it power, it will respond to. 
And I'm saying that because it means the blood of Jesus Christ is very weak if fornication can finish what he has done on the cross. Now, what does that mean? Should we now masturbate, fornicate, sobitate, or whatever tate? No. The scripture tells us that we should demonstrate our mastery over that character. Are you getting what I'm saying here? And the truth is that although it will not take you to hell, it can limit the quality of authority you demonstrate on earth. What does that mean? So, for example, the realm of the spirit will be serving you accusations. There are accusations. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The accusation does not mean they will take you to hell. But in this life, accusations will be strong against you. Why do you want to be accused? Both by your conscience and by the realm of the spirit. Do you see what I'm trying to say there? Now, in terms of the workings of that man in particular, I think I know the person I'm talking about. I hope I know the person. I just want to go there. But just in the specifics, it is not right that we think that God had no issue with the man. The man must have been dealt with by God, just that he was suppressing that expression of God's dealings in his life. He might not come out to tell you, but he must have known it was wrong. That's why after a while he stopped it. So God could have permitted it because of the kind of weakness he had and that maybe he was morally suppressing his conscience to believe that that was better than fornication. And he continued in it until he got the moral strength, underline the word moral strength, to be able to stand upright in his, um, you know, um, habit or what will I call it. So we do not condone sin. Let's be very clear. But we are saying we must not give sin too much power over our lives as Christians. However, I'm saying categorically that sin will always contend for the Christian's glory. It, that's what he's looking for. To diminish the quality of your glory. To reduce what you are supposed to amplify as glory. I get what I'm to say here. So is it possible that that man's glory was limited? I cannot say because I'm not the one that gave the glory. I'm not the one. I have no part in this matter. But I can tell you any time sin has a place, it wants to master this, this person. And the Bible says that you are servants to whomsoever you obey. If you keep serving sin, you are a servant of sin. What that simply means is that sin has control on your conscience. Can knock at your door anytime and respond to you. Even though you are of Christ, but you are serving sin. Do you get that? So that's a misnomer. Let me close with this to say that though that man may have had that condition of masturbation and all of that, his conditions were not as critical, especially because he did not have any second party involved. And why am I saying so? The sin of masturbation is different from the sin of fornication, even though he's sinning against the body. Do you understand? But the problem with sin of fornication is that you graft another man's spirit and you are one with that person's spirit. Masturbation is you alone. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? But the Bible says he that is joined with a harlot is one with that person. So you have extended your, 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 your contamination with somebody else. And what that means is that it reduces the quality of what you stand for and it serves an accusation against the both of you for as long as you are in it. Now, the, the right, right thing for a Christian to do is to ask God for forgiveness if he's involved in that. To demonstrate his commitment not to identify with sin. And having done that, stand like it never happened. The Bible says we should obtain mercy. Not beg God for mercy. No. Obtain mercy. Do you understand what I'm saying there? When you obtain, so it's like fetching water for yourself to drink from the dispenser. You don't beg and say, God, give me some water. And just give me. No. You fetch water and drink. Search forgiveness by faith at the mercies of God. And once you do that, be clear. Now, this is the part many people need to deal with. They need to wrestle with their conscience. Let me show you a scripture. Hebrews 9.14. Quickly. Hebrews 9.14. It talks about the conscience being wrestled with so that it is sanctified that you might serve the living God. If the devil can keep voicing accusation against your conscience, you will struggle to serve God. In Hebrews 9.14, can you bring it up quickly? Hebrews 9.14. Will it come up? Hebrews 9.14. I just want to show something quickly. All right. 9.14 Hebrews. It's up. How much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge what? Purge your what? Purge your what? The blood of Jesus Christ will purge our conscience. From what? From dead works like sin or adultery. Um, you know, anything that troubles your conscience. Are you seeing that? To, so that you can serve the living God. In other words, if your conscience is troubled, you can't serve God right. Do you get what I'm saying here? So it's better your, your conscience is void of offense towards God and towards man. But don't ever give sin more power than it deserves in your life. Either by obeying it or by making it feel like as if it has dismissed you from your future or from your glory. In the case of that man, I will simply say it was a dealing between him and his God. And I believe that that sin was not necessarily such that um, involved somebody else. And that doesn't dismiss the fact that sin contended for his glory and all of that. I personally believe no sin leaves you the same without contending for your glory. If you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. That's my personal opinion, and I believe it is the word of God. Did I answer your question? It's clever. Huh? Thank you. So the question the gentleman asked over there concerning was there death before life? It's simple. Yes. Death where is not necessarily the dismissal of life or the, uh, the, the termination of breath. You know, death does not mean ah, death. That's not death. From God's perspective, God's perspective of death is that you are disconnected from him as your source. So, for example, is this fan, if we unplug this fan, if we unplug the fan, is the fan dead? Do you get, the fan has been unplugged, it has gone off from the source, it is no longer functioning as a fan. Do you agree with what I'm saying? But the fan is still standing. If you plug it back, it gets life. Am I correct? making some sense? So when man sinned, we died in that we're disconnected from our source. Are you getting what I'm saying here? But we're still standing. We're still, people that are not born again are still moving around. They're still doing everything. But they are dead, quote and unquote, because they are not plugged to God as their source. Does that make some sense to you, sir? So in that sense, death existed as an effect of disconnection from God. Did I answer your question? Are you sure? Okay. So let me ask you a question. Okay. Your question was that the death exists before the creation of the world. Is that what you asked? So what part of it have I not answered? I thought I said that death with God's side is that it's a disconnection from God. So anything that is disconnected from God does not live. That's what I'm saying. So we are not going to say death existed. We created death. Do you understand that? We created death. We, get, we give death life by disobeying God. Do you get what I'm saying here? If we are not disobeying God, death will not have a place with us. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Eh? Do you get that, sir? Yeah, man created death. And that's why it's the last spirit that will be destroyed. Then to your second question, let there be light. There was a light, then there was another light. Yes, you know things are created in the realms of this life twice. Light, anything you see, must be created twice. If you don't create it in the mind first, it cannot deserve a real. This room was created on paper first. Do you agree with me? Yes. Um, this fan did not just come and let there be fan. No. There was a design. God always lays things at the background. That creation of light is not physical light. It was Christ himself. How do we know? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was with God at the beginning. All things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. He said, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, not the sunlight. So that light, Jesus is. John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. He claimed that light. Are you going to run and say so, in essence, everything that you will create must not be created in darkness. Creation is not possible in darkness. Anything you create in darkness will be deformed. So, God created light to sustain his creative power. Are you here? I'm trying to say here. And Jesus was that light that gave definition to everything he created. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if you are getting it, but you can listen to this again. 
and you will see that it serves the purpose of the answer. That is to say, if we call it revelation, you see, if you want to create anything, you need light. You cannot create in darkness. You cannot achieve in darkness. If you know the other day you were in the room and I said, why are you writing in the dark? You can't do excellent things in darkness. So God commanded light from darkness to be able to establish creation. That's just the whole concept. That light there is not physical light. It was the background under which everything we run. So if you take out light, everything goes up. So that light is what makes anything you are creating make sense. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? If you don't have that light, anything you are doing will be in darkness. And nobody does anything excellent in darkness, including God. So it's a pattern for creation for us. That if we are going to ever create anything in this life, you need light. And that light is not talking about light bulb. It's talking about inspiration. It's talking about, you know, revelation. It's talking about information. It's talking about the kind of things he wants to see. So for example, when God said, let there be birds in the air. Do you know how many birds can be? Do you know how many species of birds we have? It was from that light that options were being created. That was the light that gave everything definition. I'm not sure if I'm speaking to you at this level, but just go and think about what I'm saying, and I'm sure you will breathe on it. And so that light is not light, but it was the revelation. Christ Jesus was the light himself. Can, would that suffice for now? Eh? Yes, it should. Because if I go further, you will change the whole game. All right? But I pray that what you have asked for will open more doors into your mind and make you see the power behind what Jesus had in mind when he created this world. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a round of applause and appreciate him for that session. All right. Tonight, I just want to try to put some more flesh to something that is my current meditation. And I want to speak to the facts of what I was saying on Sunday about the progress the process of progress. The progression of process, whichever one you prefer. And on Sunday, I was speaking about how that God wants us to make progress with a systemic pattern. How God wants us to make progress gradually. He wants us to achieve certain things. And then I was saying some things on Sunday, and I'm not sure if you remember. I was talking about how that you should not just be progressing on one line alone. That God wants us to be rounded. Praise God. How that you should think about life from the side of balance. Because you see, it's not just about succeeding in one line. You know how, for me, one of the most frightening things I learned in health education as a young boy was the subject of kwashoko. I can't forget. I was probably in GS2 in that class. And then they spoke about what causes kwashoko. They said the head can just be big. Ah! And I can imagine things. I said, how can the head just be big like pumpkin? You know? And they said, the head will just be big. So I asked questions. Now, what is the cause of this type of disease? And then they said, somehow, the distribution of food, balanced diet, and all of that, you know, so, so much that you are taking lack of ions, lack of aluminum, lacking vitamin C. So it was all about balance. And for me, that was where I started to celebrate balance from. That you need what they call balanced diet. You need a little of this. You need a little of that. You need a little of this. Nothing is useless. As little as vitamin A is, if you don't take it, it will show. So, you may, may you not get to a time that you'll be buying albumin for 60,000. Do you know what? Albumin is, is, is the egg, white part of egg. Oh. And I'm like, we, we, we're buying it at some point for someone, for grandma, you know, for almost 60,000 naira, and we're like, what are we buying? They say, egg whites. These same egg whites that I would say, give me some, I'm not giving you, you know? Do you understand? And I'm like, you can be selling it to me? Yes. If you don't take those little, little nutrients of life, your life will not be nourished. The same way spiritually. If you don't have the little nutrient, nourishment of question and answers like this, of seeing where a demon is being casted out, of being where somebody is being saved, of seeing where things, those things, your Christianity, that's why you, are, you will not be thoroughly furnished. You, you will look like as if you are trying until you are not balanced. You are quashokod in the spirit. So it's important for you to expose yourself to a rich heritage of balance. Praise the Lord. Some Christians don't worship. They only take word. You are not balanced. You are quashokod. Yeah. Some Christians only take word. They don't pray. You are not balanced. 
you must be balanced. Some Christians pray and word, but they don't have money. You are not balanced. You are not balanced. Some Christians pray, they word, and they have money, but they don't fast. You are not balanced. Some Christians pray, word, fast, they have money, but they, they are not healthy. You are not balanced. You, you understand? There is so much in the Christian faith to make you balanced. That's why you see some people getting frustrated at some point and say, oh, what's all everything about? I don't even understand. I come to church. It's not church that is doing me now. It's because you don't understand how to live a balanced life. Are we making some sense here tonight? The Christian life is meant to be lived thoroughly furnished, wholesome, complete. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Apostle Paul said, I have learned how to abound and abase. That's a balanced man. I know how to live with the rich and I know how to dine with the poor. That's a balanced life. It's not that you are just spiritual. Let me show you a scripture. Ef Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 16. One of the scriptures that shaped my Christian growth. He said, do not be righteous over much. Have you seen that scripture before? Let me show it to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 16. It says, in one translation, it says, do not be over much spiritual. NIV, I think it's NIV. Uh, who is giving it to me? Is it coming up, please? Look at it. 716. I learned this scripture as a young man. He said, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Verse 17. Be not wicked over much. That's what you should be saying. Verse 17. The next verse. Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? The both of them will kill you. Now, if you read the NIV translation, it says, do not be over much spiritual. I mean, I'm amazed. I'm like, how can you be telling me not to be over spiritual? Yes, it's true. Some Christians, any small thing, praise God. <laughs> do you not change the fire of the Holy Ghost? Oh God, yes, this is just how are you? <laughs> the power of God. Uh, the Lord says, <laughs> I should tell you <laughs> that you are my wife. Oh God, yes, you are a human being, sir. Praise God. Some Christians can't laugh. You are not balanced. And it's not good. I'm telling you sincerely. It's a, it's a deficiency of spiritual nutrients. You are deficient somewhere. Some Christians are not balanced. Any small thing. <laughs> so every exposure you get in your Christian world, especially in a church like this that is sensitive to such things, you should take it as a nourishment for your faith. When I come to church, for example, and instead of preaching, I start to ask questions. It's a nourishment for your faith. It's a nourishment. You should ask yourself, why am I not having questions? How, how can I say I know all things? Yeah. So Christian faith requires, and I was talking about progress. How that if you respond to this wisdom, you will find progress in your life. Can I hear your amen? I mean, let me show you something. Can I show you something, please? Uh, in, in the book of First Timothy chapter 4, Verse 13 to 16. Quickly, please. I just want to share a few thoughts. I'm going to wrap up with something specific tonight that I prepared for. And even if I'm not going to be able to do exhaustively on it, I don't mind. I'll just drop the thoughts. It's still consistent with what I have in mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 to 16, it should finish at 16, if I'm not mistaken. It says, Till I come, give attention to reading. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. KJV. It says, Till I come, give attention to reading. He says, neglect not the gift of God that was given unto thee by the laying on of the hands by the presbytery. Am I correct? That's verse 14. Verse 15 now says, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may not may appear to all. Are, are you there? Uh -huh. He's there. Now, now, verse 16 now says, take heed to thyself. I, listen to this. Oh. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. And I'm going to speak about continuity. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. What that means, people of God, are you with me tonight, please? Is that God wants us to stay steadfast. He says that in verse 15, meditate upon these things, give yourself completely to them. Whatever you are hearing me teach you, he says, give yourself completely to them. So that you're profiting. Somebody say profiting. That means there are some Christians that their lives does not have profiting. He says that your, your profiting may appear to all. People should see that Christianity pays you. People should see that this, your faith, is good for you. He says that if you are not appearing or manifesting or profiting, it is not good for you. He says that if you do these things, you would have done well for yourself and those that listen to you. What am I saying? 
If your Christianity does not profit you, it is not Christianity. There is something about Christianity that thy profit. People should say your life is better. Amen. Once somebody sent me a chart, I said, Pastor, are you sure you are in this economy? The way you are looking, you are not behaving like you are with us. I said, how can I be with you? There is a profiting I'm operating by that is higher than your economy. It has to be so, sir. You can't be living the same life and be expecting to share greater testimonies. People will believe that we're all the same. There must be something you have as an edge. Am I making sense? Some, 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 some. So, the Christianity we live has great, tremendous promise. And I was only saying on Sunday that we should not be stereotyped or locked down in one perspective. We must be interested in, and I was talking about economy, how that there are 24 million people in Lagos, and you can make something out of that. You remember I said something like that? Yeah, you can make something out of it. What part of the economy are you going to benefit from? There is something. Don't just take it as spiritual, as spiritual alone. If you are only praying and not walking, your faith is dead. The Bible says, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. He said that demons also believe and they tremble. But show me your faith with works and I can show you that you have a future. I'm quoting James chapter 2, verse 18 to 20. So please, I want to challenge us tonight in that same spirit that your progress in life from January to date has a process. And God must have been trying to get some information across to you. Trying to pay, make you pay attention to something that you've not been paying attention to. Trying to teach you continuity. Trying to teach you steadfastness. Trying to teach you how to be rugged. Trying to teach you how to be spiritual. How to be balanced. And you're not learning. And that's what I'm trying to draw your attention to. That God is depending on your level of adaptation. To be able to bring out the glory he has invested in your life. If you're not adapting, you will be dying. The proof you are living is adaptation. You must be willing to make adjustments. Sometimes you have stayed in that long, that level for too long. The constant thing about God, even though he does not change, is that he changes things. The constant thing is always changing things. Sir. So if you are stuck in a place saying that the God we've always been worshipping, you are lost. He has moved. He has moved. He has moved. He has moved. You are stuck in a box. So you'll be wondering, where is the God I've been believing in? He has moved. You are not moving with him. Day unto day, uttered speech, night unto life, revealed knowledge. He said, There is no place where their voice is not. There is something about God that is updated. That you are not updated with Him. So I know you have been comfortable in that spiritual frequency where you worship and you have goosebumps. There is more to that God than the goosebumps. Abraham stood in the valley and said, We are going to go up the mountain to render our son as a sacrifice. He had God clearly go and render your son as a sacrifice. By the time he got to the, God, the mountain, the God of the mountain had changed. He brought out a knife and said, I'm going to kill you. God said, don't kill him or if you kill him, you're on your own. He had what God said, but much more he was hearing what God was saying. Many Christians had what God has said, but they are not hearing what he's saying. So it's not profitable. They've killed their eyes and they're looking for their testimony. Trust me, I know what I'm saying with all revelation and I say with a lot of confidence. So I'm speaking tonight to a generation, not just this church, we need to be updated. What is God doing? Don't get stuck in his ways. The God will serve if you are not flexible like the wind, you will get stuck. The Bible says that the ways of the spirit is like the wind. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's, we just know it's there. You can't predict a man that is truly working with God. So I'm saying in essence, don't use physical things to measure your progress. Follow the lineage of God's guidance. Let it be your utmost. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Let's not be caught in the trap. Some things are constant. Some things are Asian landmarks that will never change. Like prayer. We will not stop praying. Praise God. And the purpose of the prayer is to get clarity of where he is. Uh -huh. Don't just think that you are prayed to fulfill a ritual. I told you several times, if your prayer and fasting does not make you get better light, you are still stuck. It was better you did hunger strike. So your prayer and fasting is, to, is not going to change God. It's to improve you. To get the accuracy of your spirit. God doesn't get changed. You think God is... God might be eating chicken as you are fasting. He knows or not? This God, unless he's not the God of the Bible, he's not troubled. He has done his vicarious work on Jesus Christ. He poured all of his wrath on him. Everything he needed to do, he has done. And invested it all in Christ. Gave us a document, his word. Go and find out. Folks, it's up to us, sir. So you need to explore. Some Christians are just waiting for some breakthrough yellow lights to flash into their room. It's you to step out, sir. Step out. 
The God of the Bible is still alive. He might not have changed, but he's changing things on the earth. Praise God. So tonight what I really want to emphasize is not what I said on Sunday, but I was beginning to say, and I'll just quickly drop it in two minutes and we'll take the communion. What I really want to share with us tonight is, or are two things, major, concerning the progression of process. God is a God that wants you to journey with him. Some time back I was sharing after the morning prayers, and I want us to please be listening to those brief charges after morning prayers. Sometimes they can they are the freshness of my thoughts and trust me, they are from heaven. I was showing after morning prayers that we all have at least two kinds of relationships with God. We have God as a father and we have God as a king. Praise God. This God as a father gave back to us through our faith in Christ Jesus. So now are we the sons of God. Somebody say amen. amen. That should mean a lot to you. <laughs> that should mean a lot to you. If you are really a son, you should be proud that you are God's child. Can I hear an amen on this one more time? Amen. Now the Bible says that if we are his children, he chastises us sometimes. He says, for him that the father loves, the father chastises. So sometimes God will be dealing with you in some things. Amen. And the chastisement is such that it's supposed to produce righteousness. It's supposed to produce maturity. It's supposed to produce yieldedness. How yielded are you to the word of God? You see, sometimes some people go through stuff and they say, oh, boy, don't feel me, me, oh, Lord, George. Ah, what is wrong with you? God is trying to deal with you and call your attention. Who is doing favor for God? Who is benefiting? It is because you don't have a guide. I may God grant you people to help you. Oh, come on, say that amen a little better than that. So we see God trying to nurture us as sons. The Bible says, now are we the sons of God. Not tomorrow. Now are we the sons of God. Put up your right hand and say, now am I a child of God. Now, say it properly. Say, now I am a son of God. Now, now the Bible says that such sons do not have lordship over things until they mature. Galatians chapter 4, from verse 1 down to verse 4. It says that but they are put under teachers and masters until the time they mature and appointed by the Father. So as a child of God, that's not all God wants you to be. I want my children to grow. Praise God. Hallelujah. The job of any parent is that you grow. Imagine how much you made your parents proud when you wore your matriculation gown. But imagine staying in matriculation gown without convocation gown for 10 years. It's not a good one. You have not grown. There are certain things that makes a parent happy. That you grow. That you grow. That you grow. I was on the mountaintop. I think I shared the story the other time. A woman had a child two years old. The boy was lying down flat with his face on the ground. The woman shouted. They were telling, pushing her brother. She shouted. Alpha, uh, you know, what did they, he said, she, she called the name. What, what the, Woli, is it Woli? That they call prophets in Yoruba. Shouted from the back. Me only love her. Oh, oh, mommy, Ray, that's my child is here. I said, put the child on the altar. This child has to walk, sir. This child has to walk, sir. He said, it's not my child. He said, it has to walk. She used one word. Say, if Banu Jenro Jeff for me, you know that's a very strong word. That I see my child on the floor crawling at age two and a half. Huh? And I felt touched. I'm a father too. And I know what it feels like. Sir, some of us are still crawling and drooling when we have served God for six months. If you are really working with God, you should have grown with God. And one of the things that will make your growth is the dynamics so he will take you through. And the proof we know you are growing is how well you survive in tough times. When things are tough, not when things are convenient. That's when we know who is growing. How much more you can do before now. If your Christianity is still the same way you were before now, you are, you are, you are not beneficial to the kingdom. You should have grown. You could not pray for 10 minutes before. You should be able to pray for 30 minutes now. Okay, put prayer. You should be able to lead someone to Christ by now. You should have someone that you have led to Jesus by now. As a child of God, the proof is that you are fruitful. May you be fruitful in Jesus' name. Amen. The proof that you are a child of God is not that you bought a car. There are many children of Belial buying cars. Praise God. I don't mean that rudely, but it is the truth. It is the truth. On this earth, our proof that we belong to God is that we grow in God. Things of the kingdom matter to us. So that you are a child what begins to matter to the father begins to matter to you. That's a proof of growth. 
What used to matter to God starts to matter to you too. Souls being saved. The church of God being populated. The things of God working in your heart. Glory to God. They give you six people, you multiply six to twelve. They tell you to take care of two people, you multiply two to four. Four to six. Four, six to eight. They tell you to take care of this group or this cell. You take care of it and multiply it. Everybody, nobody is missing from church. Take care of this choir. You take care of choir so well. Are you getting what I'm saying here? The cares of this world has made a lot of children of God go back to the world. And they are not profitable to their father. However, there are some of us who understand the principle of the kingdom. That we are born again to be children of God so that we can invest into the kingdom of God. The relationship with God as a king makes us interested in his kingdom. We are interested in the expansion of his kingdom. We are interested in the growth of his kingdom. That not only we, does God have a family, he also has a kingdom to inherit. For the kingdom of, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his son. Glory to God. So we must be interested. And this is very key. Now, God has great plans for us. And the two major things I want to say that I've been trying to build a case for is number one, our ability to understand our role in the increment of progression. You must understand you have a role in things growing around you. And number two, understanding God's pattern of how things grow. I'll make it clear. Number one point I'm making tonight especially is that you and I have a role in the expansion of the Father's kingdom. And number two, we must understand how God makes things increase in this kingdom of our Father. In simple terms, I want to draw your attention to Mark chapter 4, verse 24 to 28. The Bible tells us that the way God makes things grow is like a seed planted into the ground of God's kingdom. And it says when you plant a seed into the ground, you don't know what happens after that. It says what we just see and notice is that the ground, first of all, begins to bud the ear, then the blade, then the full corn. I don't know if you remember that scripture. Mark chapter 4 from verse 24. And says, that's what it says. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear and what measure you met. It shall be measured to you and unto you that here shall more be given. Verse next. Verse next, please quickly. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he heard. Half, beg your pardon. Verse 26, please. Now, it says, And he said, So is what? Help me now. So is what? So is what? The kingdom of your God. Please listen to this. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. So what does that mean? God casts seed into the ground. The things you want to see, virtuous Christian center is the kingdom of God. He casts seed into the ground. Something small enters into the ground. Please watch what I'm bringing out. Then he says, the man's responsibility is to sleep and rise night and day. And seed should spring and grow. He does not know how. That means the man's responsibility is to rest after sowing the seed. Our responsibility is to rest. If at all there is any other responsibility, is to water what we have rested. Let me explain clearer. You are trusting God for something. Let's assume, for example, you are trusting God for a family. Let's use family. Or maybe a business. You are trusting God for a baptist saloon business, for example. Or virtue, 7,000. He says, my role in that kingdom of God being established is to take the seed of the word of God and plant it. The process of progress. Your duty is to plant it. Sleep, rise, night, day. That seed must grow. The part I was talking about that is your role is to plant it and water it and rest. For that seed has no choice but to grow. Then he tells us, we don't know how it will happen. I don't know how 77,000 will come. I don't know how we will pay for this place. My job was to trust him. His job is to command somebody Whatever the person must be. My job was to sow the seed. Come. Do my work. 
Rest. Sleep. Go to work. Do my business. He says, if you start with the first thing we see, ear. Some people see ears and start to rejoice. Don't rejoice. That's not the end. Some people see blade. Hey, okay, no. Calm down. The process of progress. Progressions have process. Some people don't stay at it. They cut it off. Some people are too excited. They want to see what it looks like. They uproot it. You stay at it. Some people are so discouraged. It didn't show anything for so long. They give up on it and go. Where do you want to get some 7,000 from? Where do you want to build? How? How do you want to pay for this place? 80 million. Where do you want to see it from? <laughs> God. Your duty in seeing, and I'm saying this to some of us, you know, where I've realized in every audience, people understand things differently from others. But please, by adventure, you understand what I'm saying at the highest level. Make sure you don't just understand it, but you do it. Because that's how you are going to build your multinational business. Sow the seed and say, I am going to be the richest agricultural pharmacist in this country. You sow the seed. That my, and all your job is to sow the seed and go. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 that we should not say before our angels were joking. He said, for they don't joke with our words. So whatever you say under that atmosphere has life. Your role in the progression of the process of your life is to sow the seed, water the seed, and rest. Wake up, give thanks. For the seed must bear forth fruit. When we're in school, I practice the same thing. I told, I was just about to be my, I have not met my mom at that time. I told all of them, I'm going to be the best student. I don't know why he was there. I think, okay, I told, the Lord had given me an instruction, but I can confess to you now that when I was saying, I didn't remember that God told me I was going to be the best student. You know the stuff about things. I just said, I'm going to be the best student. All of you, you just wasted your time. I just said it and I claimed it. I slept. I woke up. I wrote exam. Nobody was close to me. Was, mama was my personal person, so she was the best female student. That's what I said. Hear me what I'm saying, sir. I did not do any, I didn't beg any lecturer. I didn't do anything. Do you know, like, lecturers were literally begging me. Please come and me back my script. They were using my script as marking scheme. I did not pursue it. They had sown the seed and it had to come. That lady you want to marry, sow the seed. Relax. Give thanks. Don't do it by struggle. Let it be the kingdom of God in your family. Let that baby come by the power of God. Let the supplies come by the power of God. Let that testimony be perfected by the power of God. Sow the seed. Calm down. God will readjust everything in your favor. Number two thing, quickly, and we close with this. Ecclesiastes 23, verse 30. Don't put time up for me. Remove those type of things. You can say it another way. Right? I'll close now, but I need to deliver this. Ecclesiastes chapter um, 23 and verse 30. Let's say Ecclesiastes. I beg your pardon. Exodus 30, 23 verse 30. Let's start from verse 28. Every promised land God has given us are filled with giants. There is nothing God has promised you that you can use your strength to overcome. You will always need God to do what God tells you to do. Anytime you don't need God, his proof is not God. God will never ask you to do something that is your size for him. It's for him. So it's never your size. Once that project is in, within the boundaries of your resources, it's not God. To prove it is God, you will need him. Now see what God, God said he will do. And I will send hornets before thee, that's bees and locusts. 
which will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before thee. Now look at these verses. Oh. I will not drive them out from thee before thee in one year. Lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. Verse 30. By little and little, I will drive them out from before thee. God says, I'm going to work for you, but it's little by little. That means when you see any little progress, know that it is God. Little by little. Your God is a God of little by little. If God said, I will not drive them out once. So that they will not destroy you. So that people will not put eye on you. I will take it out. Are you seeing any little thing in your life and you think it's not God? <laughs> I've come to show you as God's servant tonight. Little by little. God said, I will take them out small by small. small. You just notice tomorrow they didn't disturb you again. Tomorrow they, little by little. Little by little. You are seeing little. You say, well, no big thing has happened in my life. God said, I won't do it in a year. I'm not the one that wrote Bibles, sir. <laughs> You've come to this church little by little. You start noticing progress. You think it's not God? He said, "I'm the one doing it by little by little." He said, "I, I, I will drive them out." The landlord they gave you this place little by little. Lease it first. Little by little, I will chase them out, so that you will know I am the one. It's going to happen little by little, until thou be increased and inherit the land. <laughs> you will be too strong to be forced out again. Are you seeing anything little around you, sir? That is the God we serve. Somebody is waiting for the big thing to prove it is God. You are ignorant. The way of progress is little by little. That's what I want to say. That's what I want to say tonight. If you can see little in your life, it is God behind it. If you can see little in this church, that somebody before that was crazy by last year is driving people into salvation. Little by little, we are catching fire. <laughs> little by little. Little by little. It's small, small. God says, I should tell us as a church, I am the one behind the little you have seen. Let me do more by thanking me for the little. Can we just thank God tonight for the little we have seen? As a ministry, as individuals, in your relationship life, you have seen little. 